Welcome back. All right, so coming out of this weekend, there is one team everybody's talking about that's struggling. Of course, I mean Columbus. Of course, I do. And one thing with this channel is I do like to focus on teams that maybe aren't being focused on, I think, enough. And Columbus would be one of those teams. Now, I'm going to say off the hop, too, that the Columbus Blue Jackets are... They're, they're definitely a team in the league that gets underreported and not enough attention. But I will say this. They haven't done a lot to garner a lot of attention throughout their history. They have the big upset win in their series against Tampa Bay. They knocked out the Toronto Maple Leafs in the play-in round in 2020. But outside of those, those incidents, those big moments, there really haven't been big moments. Now, I picked Columbus to make the playoffs. Clearly, at this stage, it looks like it's a no. And I'm trying to put together a, a board that will talk about, you know, slow starts and fast starts and how really that'll tell you how things are going. And it is very rare for a team to get off to a 3-7 and seven start and get into a playoff spot. They can get back to 500. They can get to a decent record. But can they actually make the playoffs? Not likely. So with Columbus, what's gone wrong? Well, at home, they've played six games so far. They're 2-4 and four at home. On the road, they've played four games. They're one and three on the road. So it doesn't matter where they're playing. They've found ways to lose. Uh, if you look at their goals for per game, they are 28th in the National Hockey League with 2.6. This wasn't supposed to be the case when they added Johnny Goudreau. Of course, Patrick Laine has been hurt for you know about half of these games. And so there's, there's that part of it. But the goals against is really troubling. They're dead last in the league, allowing 4.4 goals per game. It's not a recipe for any kind of success. So for Columbus, what we're looking at right now is a team that doesn't score enough and allows too many goals. And it really is that basic. Uh, their power play, what power play? Notice that I didn't need to put power play and penalty kill numbers up here like I do often when I do a board like this because they don't have one. They have a 0% on the power play. Their penalty kill, 81.3%, which is 12th. Their penalty kill has been decent. Which is odd because their defensive numbers and goaltending numbers have been god-awful. So the penalty kill being in the top half of the league is kind of a bit of a head-scratcher. Uh, their shots per game, they're, they're getting 29.7 shots per game. They're allowing 34.5. You name it, they're doing it wrong. You name it, it's a problem for the Columbus Blue Jackets right now. And so whether you're looking at a team that had this logo 20 years ago, right? I'm wearing the reverse retro, or you've got the cannon right here, so the jersey matches what's on the board. It really has been a problem, and it started off from game one, which was not troubling, right? So if you look at this schedule, it's not an easy schedule to start with. They start off at Carolina. They lost 4-1, to one, but they scored first. They scored first. They allowed the next four. Carolina outshoots them 43-32. to 32. Again, not overly alarming. Carolina's a good team. They're seen as a contender. Then, at home against Tampa in their home, their home opener, they lost 5-2. to two. So, again, you look at that and you can say, well, that's, you know, a team that's been in the Stanley Cup final three years in a row. It's not shameful to lose against Tampa. Uh, they scored first again. So, that's twice in a row they scored first and they lost uh, the shots 39-28 to for Tampa. So, they were being outshot by a combined total of 82-60 to by my math through the first two games. But, again... You can look at that and say it's fine. And then they go to St. Louis. So this is this is kind of a tough schedule in that they're away, home, and away. Uh, they allowed the first two. They did tie it at two, but they lost 5-2 to two at St. Louis. Uh, the shots were 25-25. to 25. So this is one of those games where allowing five goals on 25 shots, not optimal. And so there's definitely, there's a conversation to be had there. So that's, again, that's an 0-3 start that you can kind of look at, look at their three opponents and say, well, that's quality. So then Vancouver comes in. Well, Vancouver off to a miserable start to the season. And in a game that looked like neither team wanted to win, Columbus reluctantly wins it 4-3 to three in overtime. And if you didn't watch it, that's really how it felt. That one team would get control and then hand it back. And then they hand it over to the other. And it was just more of a, no, you want the, you want the win more. It felt like that. So they allowed the first two against Vancouver, but Vancouver hates two goal leads. So, of course, Columbus won that one. Gavrikov had the OT winner. The shots were 35 to 33 for Vancouver. Um, and yeah, so I mean, they're one and three, but they beat a team in Vancouver that was off to a miserable start. So they should win that. And then they win another one. So they beat Nashville five to three and it felt like, hey, you know, maybe we're maybe we're seeing a turnaround here. Uh, they allowed the first two against Nashville as well. 
and they came back and won it. So when we hear about the two-goal lead and how it's not safe anymore in the NHL, at least early in the season, Columbus has been proving that with their come-from-behind wins in two games. Uh, but the shots in that game were 42-26 to 26 for Columbus, which is a, a pretty good game for them overall. And again, they beat Nashville. Now, Nashville's off to kind of a miserable start to the season, same as Vancouver, but Columbus beat both teams. And that's the key, right? You want to beat teams that are struggling, uh, especially when they're coming into your barn. Uh, then Pittsburgh comes in and, and whipped them 6-3. to three. They scored first. So that's the third loss where they scored first. Uh, they allow the first two, and they win two out of three. They score first, and they lose all three. No idea. They also led three to one against Pittsburgh, and it was a five-goal outburst by the Penguins that turned that game around in their favor. The shots were 39-32 to for the Penguins. So again, you're not getting the saves that you need. That's six goals on 39 shots. Uh, and then they went to New York. And again, this is where it feels like, okay, the game against Pittsburgh was tough, but this is a good one. They won 5-1 to one at the New York Rangers. So that meant they, were, they had won 3 out of 4. And of course, if you can win 3 out of 4 games and do that consistently, you will dig your way out of an early season hole. Uh, they led 3-0 in that game. The shots were actually 31-21 to 21 for the Rangers, but Tarasov steals it. Tarasov was the first star in that game. It was the best goaltending they've had all season. And yeah, so there was reason to look at this game and say, okay, Elvis is off to a rough start, but Tarasov could fix things. Then they lost at home against the Coyotes. They lose 6-3. to three. So that's the second game out of three. They allow six goals, and they were down 4 nothing after two. So allowing the first two seemed to be a recipe for success, but if you allow the first four, less success is coming your way. Um, and so the shots in that one were actually 33-19 to 19 for Columbus. So this is really alarming that they outshoot Arizona 33-19 and lose 6-3. Not the kind of numbers you want to see. Then they lost against the Bruins 4-0. They were down 4-0 after 2 and Boston cruises from there. The shots were 35-30 for Boston. And so this is where things start to spiral. And this is how quickly it can happen. They had won 3 out of 4. The one against the Rangers it felt like was a, a momentum turner. They lose to Arizona. You can't lose that game. And then... Uh, against the Boston Bruins. Bruins are off to an 8-1 and start. They're playing very, very well. You need that game at home. They need to win that. And then yesterday, the reason we're here and we're talking about it is the insane 7-1 to drubbing that the New Jersey Devils put on them. Uh, they were down 4-1 to after 2. So, down 4 nothing after 2, 4 nothing after 2, 4-1 after 2. This is going further in the wrong direction because while they're allowing the first two in this one, they did tie it at 2. They scored first in both of their first two games. What we've seen in the last three games is this is a team that is spiraling in the wrong direction. And now they're three and seven when they were three and four and it looked like they might dig their way out of it. So the shots yesterday were 53 to 21 for New Jersey. That is the highest number of goals or highest number of shots, I should say, goals as well. But the highest number of shots they'd allowed eclipsing the 43 that they allowed against Carolina and the 39 they allowed against Tampa and the 39 allowed against uh, Pittsburgh as well. They're allowing a lot of shots and this is a problem because they're not saving a lot either. It's really basic math here. So when we look at their leading scorers, Johnny Goudreau is the leading scorer. Now the whole way through when they signed him, I said he's not scoring 115 points in Columbus He's not scoring 115 points in Columbus. He has five goals in 10 games, which is good. But the three assists for eight points, it's it's troubling. Uh, Johnny Hockey's a guy who does like to make that pass. And so if he only has three assists in 10 games, either he's not making those passes or there's nobody available. Or the guy he's passing it to, not getting it into the net. Either way, you need more than three assists. Kent Johnson's been good. Nine games, three goals, three assists, six points. But he's a rookie, and they shouldn't be necessarily counting on him for uh, the the offensive side of the game to be, you know, top two or top three on the team. Uh, Chinikov has been good in 10 games, two goals, four assists, six points. But what stands out here is he is number three with six points in 10 games. That's at a pace of, what, 48 points over 80, so maybe 49 points over 82, maybe 50. It's not great. Roslovic, 10 games, one goal, four assists, five points. Roslovic has continued to be, at times, a very useful top two center, and at times he can look lost. And this is an issue he had in Winnipeg that 
seemed to fix itself early in his career in Columbus, and now it's kind of back where it was. Uh, Voracek, five assists in 10 games. Voracek's good, but honestly, at this stage in his career, Voracek should not be the main guy you're looking to for all the helpers. Uh, Wierenski, two goals, two assists, four points in 10 games. He's been good in games I've watched, but has he been as as solid as his paycheck would tell you he should be? Uh, again, I, I don't want to pile on Wierenski. I don't want to make it feel like everybody in Columbus is bad, but it, it just it's not the kind of start that I think any of these players dreamt of. Uh, Nyquist has two goals, two assists for four points in 10 games. Nyquist had a very solid second half of last season. I don't think he's been as solid to start this one. Uh, Boone Jenner, it's been a disappointment with Jenner. In 10 games, one goal, three assists, four points. I understand he's the captain of the team. I understand that it's not all on him necessarily, but one goal in 10 games just doesn't cut it. Uh, and, and this is one of those things where then you ask yourself, okay, so when he's with Goudreau, what is... What does the chemistry on that line look like when he's been with Goudreau? Because, you know, Jenner gets the goals, Goudreau gets the assists. But so far this season, Jenner's not getting goals and Goudreau is. So something's gone wrong here. And then you've got Jake Bean with a goal, three assists, four points in 10 games. And that's the top scorers for the team. Line A just has the one goal to his name thus far. He did get hurt. He's only played, I think it's five games he's played to get to that one goal. But then you look at the goaltending numbers, and it's not good. Merzlikens, who's signed to a relatively expensive contract considering the, the production thus far, he's been 2-4 and four with an 864 save percentage. Visibly angry yesterday during the game. And what got me was, he was visibly upset during the game, and the coach didn't pull him out. I, I would have seen that and said, okay, we'll, we'll sit you down, we'll put Tarasov in, give you the rest of the night off. Uh, Tarasov, 1-3 with an 8.93 save percentage. That's not an awful save percentage, comparatively speaking, with Merzlikens, but remember, he saved 30 out of 31 against the New York Rangers. That definitely buoys his numbers. So now what makes it worse for Columbus is now they're headed overseas. They're headed over to Europe to play back-to-back -back games against the Colorado Avalanche. The Colorado Avalanche, who are off to a mediocre start to the season as well they're 4-4-1 four, four, and one. they want to send a message they want to punch these ones in so for Columbus they could easily come back 3-8-1 and one or 3-9 and nine. and at that stage it's it's pretty much done because now you're six games below 500 in a conference where in all likelihood while the west were it's looking like maybe 85 to 86 points could get in the playoffs in the west that story's going to change but that's how it looks uh, in the East, it's still going to take a lot of points to get into the playoffs. So if they come in, come home with uh, seven points in their first 12 games, uh, the amount of games they have to go over 500 to reach 100 points, it gets to be daunting. And it becomes a problem. This, uh, this is something I talked about with the Canucks team as well. It, it's not just a matter of looking and saying, okay, you have to be this far over 500. It's this team has to get it together and go that far over 500 once they've got it together. Teams don't generally rattle off a 10-game winning streak to pull themselves out of a 3-7 and seven start. Sure, it could happen. Absolutely. I'm not betting on it. Now, their schedule after they come home uh, from the, the games overseas against Colorado, it's not a terrible schedule. So they're against Philadelphia the following Thursday. That's in Columbus. I think that's a winnable game. I understand Philadelphia is right up near the top of the Metro, but... Columbus, considering what the expectations were this year and the expectations for Philly, Columbus should win that game. Then they go to the New York Islanders and play in UBS. That's going to be tough, but again, is it winnable? Yes. If this team wants to make the playoffs, these are the games they're going to need to win. They're going to need to dig down, find that fight back that they have not had in their last three games. They have shown almost no fight back, and this is where the question comes up of, are they trying to get the coach fired? And if not, why are they looking like they're trying to get the coach fired? Uh, then they come home, they play Philadelphia again the following Tuesday. So there's there's no back-to-backs during this time either. So coming back from Europe and getting acclimated again shouldn't be a major problem. Uh, then they're at home against Montreal on the Thursday, at home against Detroit on the Saturday. And then the day after, they're at home against Philly, or Florida, I should say. They've already had enough Philly as twice. Uh, then they're at home against Montreal again the following Wednesday, and they're at home against the New York Islanders the following Friday. There's a nice long homestand. The problem is, they've already played more games at home than on the road, so now they're going to have a home-heavy schedule after the two games in Europe. 
And that means that the remaining schedule after these first 20 games will be a lot of road games as well. So they're going to need to make hay with these games at home. You have to win both games against Montreal, right? I understand Montreal's currently above 500, but you have to win both games against Montreal. You have a game against Detroit. That's not going to be easy. You have a game against Florida. Those, those games aren't easy. Two games against the Islanders and two games against the Flyers. These next 10 games are the season as far as I'm concerned for the Columbus Blue Jackets. And this is a season that's already kind of hanging by a thread. Like I said, I've been looking through, and I, what I'm doing is I'm looking through the last 10 years in the NHL. Um, I'm all the way down to Florida at this point. It is very rare for a team to get off to a bad start through their first 10 games and make the playoffs. Again, do teams sometimes end up with 90 points? Yes. Playoffs? No. Uh, and it is, it is also almost as rare for a team to get off to a fantastic start to the season with seven wins in their first 10 games and somehow miss the playoffs. So for Columbus, they're teetering on the edge already. And I, I don't think it's too early if you're the general manager, if Yarmo is looking at this team and saying, I need to make some changes. I don't think it's too early for him to make that decision. The thing is, what do you change? They can't score. They can't keep the puck out of their net. Uh, they, they don't have a power play. Uh, their penalty kill is okay, but that doesn't really tell you what you need to change on the team necessarily. And the easy answer is, well, they can fire the coach. That is the easy answer. But I don't know that a new coach necessarily turns this around. And if you're going to be of the mind that you're going to fire the coach, you can't do what the Canucks did last year and wait too long. So that by the time Brad Larson's out, the replacement has almost no chance of getting him into the playoffs, which is where Boudreaux was when he took over the Canucks. So... Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. So, uh, CBJ fans, I'll ask you guys. What can fix what's wrong with the Blue Jackets? Um, is this a matter of they brought in Johnny Hockey and that was supposed to fix things, but they lost Bjorkstrand, so there's some change to the chemistry. Does that change to the chemistry plus injuries equal what we've seen thus far? And what happened in the last three games where that fight back, you want to see a team angry about losing. Like, and again, I'm not talking about, like, bench-clearing brawls. I'm not talking about, like, taking, you know, throwing dirty hits. But at least seem angry that you're losing these games. At least seem, like, again, Elvis is the one that kind of stands out because we know he said publicly he's kind of ticked off about the way this is going. Does he have a role in it? Absolutely. But should he be angry? That's also an absolutely. I'd be more concerned if he said, yeah, no, we're all playing. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I would much rather see a goaltender angry about the way things are going, even when he's part of the problem, than not. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. As always, don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.